Okay, good. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the speak, uh, the organizers for putting up together uh, this nice event and uh, conference. So today I'm uh, glad to share with you some of our recent works on the properties and mechanism for charge for e-superconnectivity. Uh, this is based on two works, one of my, one with my postdoc, Nikolai Gnetzloff, and the other is with uh, Yiming Wu at Stanford, who is in the audience. Um, so let me start by some gradual level basic background information about regular superconnectivity. Right? It's characterized at the mean field level by a uh, pairing term and uh, you have flex quantization. And also what's really powerful is that uh, at mean field level, the model is not interacting and from the surface get gap, we understand a lot of properties from it. Uh, and then superfluid density, remarkably, at zero temperature, you can show that it's actually non-perturbative in the order parameter, meaning that even though you have an infinitesimal order parameter, superfluid density at zero temperature is exactly the same as the total uh, electron density. And uh, it, needless to say, it emerges by a weak coupling instability of a Fermi liquid, uh, basically known as the BCS theory. So let me do a very brief review of a charge 4 superconductor. Uh, at the mean field level, first of all, you would imagine in the, so in the Hamiltonian, you would add a quartetting term uh, to your Hamiltonian, characterized by uh, this. Uh, one, two, three, four means different kinds of degree of freedom, uh, different momentum or different species. And uh, in this case, the vortex quantization will become HC over 4E. Four represents uh, the, element, uh, the, the charge of the bound state. And there is remarkably some, uh, some really recent evidence in this Kagome metal. Uh, however, I understand up to this day there's some still debate on it. And even if HC over 4E is confirmed, still there are other interpretation of the uh, nature of the pairing state. But suppose we put this uh, uncertainty from the experimental evidence aside, there's still some very basic, interesting theoretical questions uh, that needs to be answered. For example, uh, unlike the charge 2E case, even if we consider a mean field theory for uh, charge 4E superconductor, it is already interacting, right? So even at mean field level, we have an interesting interacting system. Uh, also, since there is no, uh, it is known there is no um, weak coupling instability that drives a metal into a charge 4E superconductor, then uh, an interesting question is what kind of mechanism can drive the system into a charge 4E superconductor? And um, so if we know that the, uh, parent, the, the mechanism for charge 4E is not at weak coupling, then there is no reason to expect that the mean field uh, theory we write down for the charge 4E superconductor is a weakly interacting system, right? So which makes this kind of questions, such as whether the ground state is a gap state or a gapless state, and if it is indeed a, a superconductor, what's its uh, superfluid density? These questions become interesting and non-trivial to answer, okay? So to answer the first two questions that follows under the category of the property of a charge 4E superconductor, uh, we consider the, we use the recent development in the tool from uh, Sasha Xavier Kitab model, and we had a model for charge 4E superconductor. So the model we write down is pretty similar to some early work by uh, Debanjan and Erez and Sentel. Uh, the only difference, uh, so the idea is to, to have the uh, SYK model and add space to it. Okay, in particular, we consider a two-dimensional model, but what's different is that we, aside from adding the random uh, uh, inter uh, pair hopping interactions, we also add the charge 4E interaction, which is also random in the flavor species, but there is full phase coherence in space, which is a constant. And uh, uh, because thanks to the SYK nature of this model, uh, the, it becomes fully solvable. Okay. In particular, we'll be considering the large N limit, and we will take the bandwidth of the uh, system to be much smaller than the interaction strengths of the system problem, okay? So let me briefly go over uh, the results without too much details. Uh, so we find the that the system displays different behaviors across different interaction, uh, different uh, energy scales. This is actually quite similar to what was found in the original paper without uh, charge for E superconductivity. So at the lowest energy scales below a renormalized band width, uh, the system behaves as a heavy Fermi liquid. And if we further go to the intermediate energy scale, the system behaves like a non-Fermi liquid, which is basically the same as zero plus one D SYK model. If you go to even uh, higher energy scales, the system behaves like a quantum gas, okay? 
Uh, on the other hand, uh, we are also interested in asking uh, what is the property uh, of such a superconductor, right? We already said uh, the system is actually a gapless system. This is already drastically different from a usual charge 42E superconductor, which is gap. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we were able to solve the superfluid density exactly thanks to the nature of the SYK model. Um, uh, in particular, we were able to solve the uh, paramagnetic term in the superfluid density. The way we solved it is to uh, derive it from how water density needs to be modified. So the first term is would be the more water density. But on the other hand, because U1 symmetry is broken by the model, then there are additional terms you, you, you need to add to it. In general, this is not a solvable. Uh, this, these diagrams cannot be analytically summed, but because we're considering an SYK-like model, uh, you can write them in terms of Mellon diagrams. And by exactly solving it, uh, we found that the results for the superfluid density is given by completely uh, the infrared properties uh, of the of the system. Here, beta is a positive number. Uh, it's expressed in terms of the Z factor and the renormalized mass. And in our calculation, we'll find this beta is always positive. Then you do see that the superfluid density is always smaller than the total uh, density of the system. Uh, what is also interesting is that uh, when the uh, charge 4E order parameter is small, then the superfluid density is actually perturbative in the strength of your order parameter. This is very different from a charge 2E superconductor, where no matter how small your order parameter is, uh, it's always, uh, NS is always equal to N, at least in the BCS superconductor. Okay. Uh, and also, uh, I would like to mention that the superfluid density also satisfied the uh, bound by the epsilon rule uh, referenced in Mohi's talk. Okay, so uh, for the next part, I would like to focus on what kind of mechanism that can give rise to a mean field charge for E superconductor. Okay, so before, I've been focusing on basically, suppose for well, whatever mechanism, uh, I have a charge for E superconductor in hand. And right now, the question I try to answer is what kind of mechanism can give rise to that? Okay. So uh, the starting point of my model would be some pair density wave states. Uh, to be brief, the pair density wave is a superconducting state uh, with uh, electron pairs, but it breaks not only the U1, uh, charge conservation symmetry to Z2. Also, it breaks translational symmetry. Okay. In real space, it has some oscillations. Uh, the question, so um, the idea here is actually proposed initially in the paper by Eris, Eduardo, and Steve. Um, so suppose uh, I consider a pair density wave that breaks multiple symmetries. Once I include the fluctuation effect, then there's no reason to expect uh, the both symmetries to be broken at the same temperature, right? So uh, based on the phenomenological study, then there are multiple, uh, it was found that there are multiple uh, possibilities. For example, if you restore translation symmetry, then the system only breaks U1. It is indeed just the charge for E superconductor. But if you restore the U1 conservation, then it becomes the charge density wave state. So in particular, the charge for E order parameter can be viewed as a vestigial order in which uh, the product of delta Q and delta minus Q is non-zero, but on the other hand, individually, if you measure them, they're both zero. However, uh, what I mentioned is a phenomenological study, right? But since then, there has been a lot of attempts to obtain a charge for E superconductor from some microscopic mechanisms. And these studies are not limited to pair density wave states. There are also other studies by Raphael, uh, and York uh, that utilizes a multi-component superconductor. Either, uh, neither of them are pair density waves, but the idea is still to study whether this kind of bound state is possible that carries charge E, 4E. But unfortunately, I think in these studies, uh, uh, it is possible to get tendency toward charge 4E superconductivity. However, uh, there are always the secondary subleading instability. Uh, the leading instability is usually some pneumatic order or other, uh, for example, charge density wave order. So the question I wanted to address for the remaining of my talk is whether or not there is a natural microscopic mechanism that gives rise to a charge for E superconductivity as a leading instability. Okay. So uh, since I, my goal is to construct a microscopic model for a uh, microscopic model, so I should start with a microscopic model for pair density waves, which by itself is a very formidable, formidable task 
not because lack of trying, uh, but in recent years, there has been some progress on this. Uh, it turns out in order to favor a uh, paired entry wave instead of a you know, uniform superconductor, uh, the price you need to pay is to uh, find a way to uh, eliminate the, uh, the, the, the Hubble interaction. But what you have instead to consider is some kind of uh, repulsive um, pair hopping interactions. Okay? So the pair hopping range needs to be finite. Then if you go to Q space, uh, this is the work by, uh, by uh, Yiming and uh, Pavel and uh, Avishkar and Shri, uh, and also a related work by Peter Hirschfeld's group. Uh, so if you um, Fourier transform this kind of interaction to momentum space, then you will see these oscillations as a function of uh, Cooper pair momentum. And of course, this uh, interaction in the pair hopping channel will be renormalized by the fermion bubble, but still, uh, usually it gets the attraction at some finite uh, momentum, which is Q. And this Q uh, is determined both by the interaction, as I said, and also by the uh, Fermi surface properties, because Fermi surface tends to also normalize that. And if I'm working on this, solving this problem on, in the continuum, then the PDW wave vectors, pair density wave vectors, they form a ring here, which can be viewed as a both surface. But if I do it on the lattice, then what you have is, are these both spots which are uh, 90 degrees away from each other and related by C4 rotation. So uh, in order to consider any fluctuation effects of a pair density wave state, uh, we need to consider how they interact with each other. Right? So the problem we're, we'll be considering is to think about how these PDW wave order parameters, which are bosons, can themselves pair into a uniform state that will carry uh, charge 40. So just like in uh, fermionic pairing problems, where we usually consider uh, interactions between fermions by exchanging low energy bosons, here is kind of the reverse, right? We consider the bosonic interactions coming from uh, bosons exchanging low energy fermions, right? So the diagram is slightly more complicated, uh, but uh, the real constraint uh, does not come from the lack of low energy fermions, right? Because in the system, you have a Fermi surface, a lot of low energy fermions, even though you don't have any quantum criticality in it. However, uh, the constraint really comes from kinematics, right? So you need a, the goal, the, the, the difficult, the challenging part is to put all these uh, fermions onto the Fermi surface, okay? So if you just have a generic Q, then it's very easy to verify at least one of these fermions will be falling off the Fermi surface and will be deep in the Fermi C. However, there is a simple geometric relation that in which case you can keep all four fermions on the Fermi surface. This is satisfied in the simplest case when this uh, wave vector is square root of two times the Fermi vector. In this case, these low energy fermions required to be put into the internal lines come, just form a square in momentum space. This is K. Um, T minus K, K minus Q, and Q minus K here. Okay. So this is a condition. Uh, you may think, okay, maybe this requires some kind of fine tuning, but it turns out it's not. In the, you know, toy, in the artificial model that was proposed by Sri Raghu's group, uh, as I said, Q was determined by both the interaction and the Fermi surface uh, shape. So it's actually uh, tunable, for example, by doping. So in that case, in the continuum, it does require tuning but it doesn't require fine tuning, which is defined as tuning uh, two parameters at once. Okay. What is even better, uh, if I consider a lattice model, we find that if I put this Fermi surface closer to Van Hoff doping, because these uh, regions in the Fermi surface are more important than others with higher density of states, uh, this condition is automatically uh, satisfied. So there's no tuning needed there. All you need to do is to Place your, put your Fermi surface close enough to the Van Hoff doping point. Okay. And incidentally, Andre and I, when I was a student, uh, we worked on uh, uh, different kinds of uh, instability in so-called spin fermion model with anti-ferromagnetic ferromagnetic fluctuations. Back then, we also looked into uh, pair density wave order parameters. Of course, in that model, uh, pair density wave do not show up as a leading instability. Uh, the leading instability, of course, is the D-wave superconductivity. But interestingly, this condition is also satisfied. The square root of two relation is also satisfied. So the, the point is that uh, the detailed uh, underlying 
uh, fermionic mechanism for, for, for pair density wave is not that important for what I'm going to discuss next. Because different kinds of model, as long as this one condition is satisfied, uh, I should be able to proceed with the same theory going forward. Okay. So uh, I've been talking about only one kind of interaction, which involves uh, psi. Psi is a PD double order parameter. It was P minus P and Q minus Q. But of course, there are other kinds of four boson interactions in the system. Uh, so I've been I have represented them in these Feynman diagrams. Uh, uh, in particular, this first term is nothing but the Gaussian fluctuation of the PDW order parameters. Uh, the second term represents a pneumatic tendency, a tendency forming a pneumatic state. Uh, it favors when uh, one of them, delta P or delta Q, is smaller than the other. So this can be viewed as a driving force toward a pneumatic state. Okay. Uh, the third term is, cor does correspond to the 4E fluctuations. So you may wonder if I have all these kinds of interactions, uh, you know, the system can be strongly correlated and all these interactions would have non-trivial interplay with each other. Uh, however, by evaluating these diagrams, we found that as long as temperature is much smaller than EF, actually the relevant interaction of interest to us, which is corresponds to the charge 4E fluctuations, is much larger than everything else. It's one over T divergent, while the others either have a weaker divergence or is small in one over EF. So it's safe to only consider this charge 4E fluctuations. So this is a key insight why charge 4E uh, uh, superconductivity is a leading instability compared to other kinds of uh, instabilities. Yes. Uh, yes, if you do this uh, diagram, you have 1 over omega squared plus E squared. That give you 1 over T. There is another 1 over omega squared plus E prime squared. That give you another, uh, no. Yeah, if you do the momentum integral, is you get 1 over uh, omega squared and integrate over frequency is 1 over T. The reason is, is kind of similar to, to the log instability in Cooper problem. You have this, the relevant fermions in this problem is K minus K and P minus P. So you have this automatic nesting from time resource symmetry, right? These others, uh, either there is uh, double poles or there is a double pole followed by some log log uh, divergence. No, I, I probably used the wrong word for nesting. Uh, no, you. Wait, sorry, you do need to linearize the dispersion in order to get this. So it's not. Uh, um, right. It's curve cut off by the curvature of the Fermi surface. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, uh, so we have provided arguments that uh, no, only the charge for E interaction needs to be considered. Uh, so the next step would be to see how this interaction can lead to a uh, superconnect charge for E superconducting state. But one obstacle is that this interaction is repulsive, right? So, uh, but this is where we can borrow, take a page from uh, fermionic pairing problems with uh, repulsive interactions. The main uh, game we play here is to have, have some kind of sign change in your order parameter in some higher angular momentum channel. Namely, if I just rewrite this interaction as these two terms, then you see the second term, which corresponds to a D wave, in, D wave channel for charge 4E because the change of sign upon the rotation uh, is indeed attractive. And then we conclude that uh, the, 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 the um, charge 4E instability comes from the D wave channel that changes sign once you rotate the system by uh, 90 degrees. In principle, this can be, say, detected in space sensitive experiments. Uh, so next we set out to, uh, this is a little technical, but I'll do it quickly, uh, to obtain a mean field theory for the vestigial charge order. So the game to play here is to think about a way to introduce the order parameter and integrate out the original PDW order parameter to find the free energy for the charge for E super order parameter. Usually this is done through a hubbard stoltonovich uh, uh, transformation to decouple this. However, I would like to mention that since this term at quartic order is negative, so it is necessary to include high order terms, which we did in our paper. But Having this psi to six order immediately invalidates the method of Hubbard-Sohanovich because that can only decouple quartic terms. 
the way we do it instead is again to borrow something from the SYK model. Uh, we introduce a uh, Lagrange multiplier field, which enforces delta to be equal to this uh, bo boson bilinear. And doing that, I can just replace this quartic term and whatever term, order term, with this delta order parameter. And what I have for it in terms of the original PDW order parameter is completely bilinear, which can be integrated out. And if I take saddle points uh, for these auxiliary fields, I should be able to get a free energy for the D-wave uh, charge for E order parameter. And long story short, we found that this transition is first order, and it occurs above the pair density wave ordering um, temperature as a vestigial order. OK, so uh, let me briefly mention my summary. Uh, so in the first part of the talk, in order to address these basic properties of a uh, charge 4E order parameter, we constructed an SYK-like model for it that allows us to compute the superfluid density, including the paramagnetic contribution. Uh, we found that it's perturbative in the order parameter, delta 4E, unlike charge 2E, and the system is a ground, in the ground state is gapless, and we discussed a microscopic mechanism for D-wave charge 4E superconductor from PDW fluctuations. And importantly, in this case, it's very clear that pair, uh, charge 4E superconductivity is the only leading instability as a vestigial order. Uh, finally, I think as an open question, I think it's as uh, experimental evidence for pair density waves mounts in recent years in different kinds of systems, for example, in the cool place or recently in UT2 and in Kagome metals, uh, I think it, there's a good chance that the charge 4E or even higher charge superconductivity is just lurking somewhere. But the, uh, but the real uh, challenging problem is to find the smoking gun or direct evidence that can unequivocally, uh, univocally, uh, can unambiguously, uh, unambig anyways, uh, be <laughs> used as an evidence for charge 4E superconductivity. Uh, so far, uh, we, despite uh, we have been trying a lot, uh, uh, all these evidence for experimentalists are kind of indirect. It would be good to think more in this direction. With that, I would like to thank you. Hi, Sean. Uh -huh. um, I had two questions. One is technical, the other is more about your last point. So uh, I'll start with the technical one. One thing that I, it was not very clear to me is that, so when we were, as you mentioned, we always found this vestigial phase in, in multi-component to be, at best, degenerate right. or subleading. Right. And one thing that was kind of tricky was that um, there are, because of fears or identities, there are lots of ways of decoupling these quartic terms. Right. So, you know, that's why in the end we just did variation because we couldn't have a unique answer. Right. So, uh, what was the, the main point, what is right. the key point here that you, you avoided that issue? Or maybe you didn't right. and you... Uh, yeah, that's, that's a very good question. So, indeed, uh, for example, even if I only focus on this beta term here, there are different ways to decouple these fields. For example, if I uh, focus on this psi p and psi star minus q, that leads to a charge density wave instability, right? So you may wonder what's so favorable about decoupling it in the pairing channel, right? The answer is uh, the unique feature I have in the problem is a both surface that looks like a, that's an analog of a Fermi surface. So it's the same story as a competition of superconductivity and CDW for Fermi surface, because for charge density wave, you would need nesting of the Fermi surface. So in here, if I wanted to do integrate out the psi field, uh, I would need the nesting. In order to favor the CDW channel, I would need nesting of the both surface, which I don't have in these models. But this both surface is, OK, maybe we can discuss more right. later. I, I right. to both surface is either this circle or these spots. right? So if you consider oh, okay. P and Q, there is a mismatch between the low energy modes. Okay. So that favors, disfavors the CDW instability. Can I do a follow-up? Thank you. Do you wait, Tim? <laughs> uh, so the, the last part. So you mentioned there's a small superfluid density, right? And there's also it's also gapless. Yeah. So are these gapless excitations that will form a Fermi surface? Are they? Yeah. They they can't be original Fermions because you have a no. superfluid density, yeah. right? Yeah. So. Uh, 
what are they and, and can they themselves be unstable towards another symmetry? Yeah, it's a very good question as well. Uh, so there is a Fermi surface, but since U1 symmetry is broken, there is no Luttinger theorem left. And we actually did a micro, uh, perturbative calculation of uh, change of the Fermi surface volume. So indeed, if you have an electron Fermi surface, then it actually shrinks uh, with the magnitude proportional to delta square. Uh, if it is a whole like Fermi surface, it also shrinks in the whole direction, uh, depending on the particle asymmetry. Uh, and your question is whether this, the, um, this remainder charge 4E Fermi surface can be subject to further instability. And the answer is yes, which we studied in the first paper. It turns out this remainder Fermi surface can uh, go into pairing themselves. And the symmetry that's broken would be from Z4 to Z2, which is even lower. Yeah. Just a na naive question. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any issues related to effects of Coulomb repulsion for, for, for the phase you are discussing? Um, here, I am considering the pairing, the interaction between uh, between bosons, right? And these bosons are do carry charge or 2E, so they should be also subject to Coulomb repulsive interaction, right? Uh, so which we haven't carefully studied, but fortunately here we do have uh, we are in the D wave channel, so it's less susceptible to destruction by Coulomb interaction. But that's a very good point that that should be further studied. Let me quickly ask a simple question, probably. Yes. Since uh, the transition into this charge E state is huh? first order. Yeah. Is there a danger that you simultaneously create primary order parameter? What do you mean simultaneously create? Well, right. the order is jumps to such a high value right. that you bring the system by this into yes. effective attention yeah. for yeah. the primary order parameter. Yeah, in the unbiased, in the uh, the way we do it here, of course, is the same game. We extend the boson number to large M here. Of course, in that framework, the primary order never orders just because you have so many components, right? But if I have the original model, uh, then it is a valid concern here. Uh, so far, we've been thinking about maybe doing some quantum Monte Carlo here. There is a sign problem that needs to be deal dealt with. It's a little bit, you need to have particle symmetry to, to do that. Yes. Thanks. Hi, Yushan. Yes. Uh, thank you for your last talk. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, in Takumi metal CVS system, yeah. uh, Gen 1's group found the charge 4E evidence. So I just wondering, yeah, could you provide more details? So what, what did they do about? Uh, uh, I did have a figure there, uh, but I, I'd rather not uh, speak too much on the experimental side. Uh, but uh, I think what they are having is uh, in this indirect evidence for HC over 4E, HC over 4E vortex, as well as HC over 6E vortex, which would indicate a uh, charge 6E superconductivity. Okay, thank you, I say, yeah. thank you. It's oscillations, yeah, indirect evidence, I think, yeah. Yeah, so my question is, to what extent your, your first part with the annihilation iterator to the fourth power is uh, equivalent to your second part? Uh, and what to the first power? Sorry? You started from the Hamiltonian, which is just psi to the fourth, right? In the first part of your talk. Just right, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, Are you talking about even, the yeah, even before? To which extent, yeah, yeah, this uh -huh. one. Right. To which extent it is equivalent to your second part? Right. So the whole second part is to see what kind of interaction can give rise to this, this mean field Hamiltonian. Um, right? Sorry, just, um, I can see immediately that the second part, oh, right. it gives uh, this, right. uh, this Hamiltonian. Right. Yeah. Okay. Isn't it more like BC than BCS, if I can make, make compare these approaches? In the second part, well, in the second part, it's always at finite temperature. So in the first part, I only talk about zero temperature properties. Uh, but I'm not sure what you mean by BCS versus BEC. Like you yeah, start you from bosons. For me. Yes, I do have bosons pairs. And yeah, here is yeah. fermionic curve from right. the very yeah. beginning. Yeah. So it's quite different, right, these two right. models? But it probably requires a further study because even though in the presence of these bosons, the Fermi surface is still there because PDW water parameter cannot fully gap out the Fermi surface. 
Uh, so the exact details is, yeah, still remains to be Thank seen. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.